Welcome to the podcast for Healing Neurology, where we talk about everything that can help heal your neurology, which is really everything from food, lifestyle, and medicine to nature, culture, and politics. There's no topic too big or too small. I'm Jillian Ehrlich, family nurse practitioner certified in Ayurveda and functional medicine. And I am thrilled to actually have one of our staff members here today. Jody Boone is an Ayurvedic wellness counselor, Ayurvedic therapist, and yoga teacher. Her passion for yoga led her to study yoga sister science, Ayurveda. Jodi lived in India for many years where she formally studied Ayurveda at the Ayurveda Natural Health Center. Upon returning to Seattle, she continued her Ayurvedic studies at Kerala Academy with Dr. Jai Rajan Kodakanath. She has also studied with Dr. Vasant Ladd during his summer seminars at the Ayurvedic Institute in Albuquerque, New Mexico, which is where I studied. Before working for the Center for Healing Neurology, she worked as an Ayurvedic therapist at Bastyr Natural Health Center in the Ayurvedic Sciences Department. In addition to working as an Ayurvedic therapist, Jodi is studying counseling psychology at the Seattle School of Theology and Psychology. She also has her master's in nonprofit business, which she did not include in her bio, but I just wanted to let you know that this uh, soft-spoken practitioner is just a powerhouse of talent um, and insight. So we have her here at the Center for Healing Neurology offering treatments for patients, and these treatments span the gamut of body work, which is what we're going to focus on today, but also nutritional counseling, as well as Ayurvedic lifestyle and um, constitutional counseling and Let's dive right in. Welcome, Jody. Thank you so much, Jillian. I love being here. Thank you. Me too. I love you here too. So we have done some podcasts before on Ayurveda, but in case folks haven't heard that podcast, let's just do a brief introduction. What is Ayurveda? Ayurveda is India's traditional medical system. It's more than 5,000 years old, and it's actually considered the world's first healthcare system. Ayu means life and Veda means knowledge. So it's often translated as the science of life or the knowledge of life. And I've even seen it translated as the sacred knowledge of life. So beautiful. Yeah. And it's a holistic system based completely upon the principles of nature. And what this means is that when we align ourselves with nature's rhythms, we experience a profound sense of balance and well-being, which translates to health and happiness. And so Ayurveda is concerned with the health of all aspects of our being. So our hearts, our minds, our bodies, and our spirits. And we're mostly focusing on balancing the life force energies within us, which Ayurveda calls doshas. And doshas are energies that can go out of balance. So we're working always to bring them back into balance. So we also feel balanced. Beautiful. And so how is... Ayurveda different from Western medicine? What can Ayurveda offer us that our conventional medical system doesn't yet offer us per se? Yeah, so Ayurveda being completely natural um, only uses substances that we would find in our environment naturally in nature. Ayurveda says you are nature. So what heals you is also found within nature. And so Ayurveda is a profound healing science on its own, and it can also be a beautiful complementary science. So if you're receiving Western treatment for something, you can complement it with Ayurvedic uh, treatment. The two come together beautifully. And Ayurveda really looks at each individual holistically. Um, As I mentioned, it sees you, you know, your body, your mind, your heart, and your spirit. And all suggestions that are made through Ayurveda are based on that on you as a unique individual. So we talk about at the unique, at that moment of your conception, at the moment of each of ours conception, all the forces acting in the universe went in to contribute to create just who we are. And that is why we are unique beings in the world. Mm -hmm. And that unique constitution develops over the nine months in utero. And then it's essentially solidified with our first breath. So there's always the pit, the mind that wants to say, well, what about the identical twins? You know, they have the identical genetic information, but Even within the womb, they'll have different access to nutrients. They'll have different access to light. One twin will be in the front of the womb. One might be towards the back. They'll have different experiences even through that development. And that is how we remain unique beings throughout the course of our life. So Ayurveda is unique in the world and that it treats each of us individually. Yes, I love what you said about, you know, your Ayurvedic constitution is determined at conception. It never changes. But as you mentioned, once we're born and we come into the world, we come in and out of balance throughout the day. And 
some of these imbalances are very minor, like we might feel sleepy or we might feel hungry, and those are easy to remedy. Um, just moving through this life, you know, we can experience greater imbalances mm-hmm. where we might need to use things like herbs or self-care practices or Ayurvedic treatments to really help to bring us back into balance. Beautiful. And so, yes, so the treatments that we're using in Ayurveda are essentially specific for us to match our current constitution back to our innate constitution. So that is how medicine for one can be poison for another, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. So let's talk a little bit about Ayurvedic body work. We know I'm going to skip over nutrition and lifestyle at this point, um, although you do do those consultations um, and our other Ayurvedic practitioners also do those consultations. But let's dive in to talk about body work today because touch is one of the oldest healing mechanisms of our animal species. And let's talk about what does Ayurvedic body work entail? Ayurvedic body work is profoundly nourishing. In our training, and you know this too, Jillian, um, Ayurvedic practitioners and therapists and doctors, physicians even, are trained to treat each person they work with as a mother might treat her newborn child. And so there's a lot of love that goes into every one of these treatments, deeply, deeply nourishing the person that we are working with. And Ayurveda has such profound respect for each individual. And that's why there's so much emphasis on the individualization of the treatments. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, no two people are uh, sort of treated the same in Ayurveda. They might receive a similar treatment like Abhyanga, the traditional oil massage, but we might use different oils for that person, different herbs, different essential oils, our pattern of strokes, the cadence might be more fast or more slow or more deep or more soft. And so it's very nuanced and it's very specific to the person that we're working with. And really our sole intention is to nourish the person deeply on all levels, physically, mentally, spiritually, and emotionally. Mm. So can you talk about this type of, say, Abhyanga, this type of massage versus, say, like a Swedish massage? Yes. And of course, both are beautiful and beneficial. Something that's unique, I think, to Swedish massage is if I were to come in to see a Swedish massage practitioner, I might have a very specific complaint in my body. And then maybe the therapist would really focus on, for example, my shoulders or my lower back. In Ayurveda, we treat the whole body. And so from head to toe, literally, And people can have also specific areas they'd like focused on, and we can incorporate that. But Ayurvedic massage, Abhyanga, the traditional massage, is really known for the oils that we use. The oils, they're warm, they're infused with herbs and other essential oils. And we use these traditional rhythmic strokes. So we're applying the oil literally to the entire body. And it has a profound effect on the nervous system, on the mind. People often will say, this was one of the most nourishing experiences I've ever had. People will say it felt like a meditation or they've been transported. And as you know, both a recipient of Abhyanga and also a practitioner, um, I can say that it is a meditation. And we go into a treatment with such reverence and also with intention. So we want to know the person's intention, the person receiving, and we hold space for that intention. And I think something that's really important to mention is that there's a a deep and profound spiritual aspect to Ayurveda because it's looking at the whole being, not just their physical body. For some who hold strong religious beliefs, is this counter to that? Yeah, it's such a good question. And this is asked very frequently? And the answer is no. There's nothing that would conflict with any other religious belief. Ayurveda is not a religion in the same way that, for example, yoga is not a religion, but it honors the spirit within. So whatever one's spiritual background is, that is not important. And it's not something we even discuss necessarily in the intake, although we can. But it's it just recognizes and honors the, the light that illuminates the physical form. We can all acknowledge this. We all are witness to this every day. There is something that illuminates the physical form. And Ayurveda is also working with that. 
illumination, that light, that spirit, that soul, whatever label we choose, it's not focused on a specific religion, for example, or a specific spiritual practice. It's just an acknowledgement and also a reflection of what illuminates the physical form. And for those who have pain or have a background of trauma, for people essentially whose bodies are not safe places to be, how does Ayurveda address essentially comforting a person where it's not safe to be in their body? Yeah, that is such a good question. And Ayurveda does address it. So what's unique also about Ayurveda is the intake. So for example, if someone were to have an Ayurvedic consultation, um, consultations take time. We spend an exorbitant amount of time really uh, asking about a person's background, health history, preferences, likes, dislikes, just their daily rhythms. We learn so much about an individual and often people will share if they have trauma in their background. And it's very helpful if people do share this with us because then we can tailor the treatment specifically so that we're not doing anything that may trigger a trauma response. And so always, for example, letting a person know, now I'll cover your eyes if that's okay. We're seeking permission each step of the way, always asking, is it comfortable, for example, to touch your abdomen? Can we massage your feet? Can we massage your head? So we're really checking in and making sure before we perform the treatment that people know exactly what's involved with the treatment and they can opt in or opt out of anything that we have to offer. And for example, if they choose to opt out of one aspect of the treatment, let's say oil application to the ears or a few drops of nausea oil in the nose, still the treatment is effective and complete. And we're just honoring the individual and her specific needs. Excellent. So let's dive in and talk about some of these different treatments. Yes. Let's start with Reiki or energy work. Yes. Um, can you talk a little bit about that? Yes. So Reiki, uh, people might know this term. Reiki is universal energy. And so a practitioner of Reiki has been attuned to channel universal energy. So when a person is, for example, giving a Reiki treatment, they're not working with their own energy. They're not infusing their energy into the person who is receiving. They are acting as a clear channel with clear intention to let universal energy, which is healing energy, flow through them. And we know Reiki or Prana, it has immense intelligence. It knows exactly where to go. And so without any conversation at all, we could actually give a Reiki treatment. Usually, of course, we do an intake. We uh, check in, ask about intention, areas of focus. But let's say we didn't even do that much. There's such intelligence with Reiki or prana or life force energy, or in this case, Reiki universal energy. The energy knows exactly where to go. And we can perform this touching a person, very hands-on, or we can also do it above body. So if anyone wasn't comfortable having the hands-on treatment, they could receive the treatment just with the practitioner having hands just above and around the body. Also with Reiki, it's done person is fully clothed, um, kept very warm and comfortable, propped with pillows under their head, under their thighs and knees, um, just so you feel fully supported so you can really relax in the moment and receive once something that's really important to know in order to really receive, we have to be relaxed. And so we take great care in helping people position themselves on, for example, the massage table, whether that's a Reiki treatment or one of the other Ayurvedic treatments. We want people to be comfortable so they can relax and receive. And with the Reiki treatment, we are giving Reiki for about 60 minutes or so. And then we leave time at the end also for people to ask questions or to even share anything that we felt or that came up. And so that's also part of a, a Reiki treatment. But most people, uh, once they've received a Reiki treatment, they feel, yeah, deeply relaxed. They feel like they've been transported, a sense of peace, tranquility. It's extremely healing and profound. And it's one of the great mysteries of life, too. How is it? How so? How is it one of the great mysteries of life? 
Yes, I think because when we speak of universal energy, it's something we can all feel. It's something we're all affected by, but it's not something we can see. It's not something that's tangible and we can only describe it in words to a certain point. Mm -hmm. So that's what makes it one of the the mysteries of life. It's something we can all feel. Um, We know it exists. And also it's, yeah, it's not tangible. We can't touch it and it's hard to put words to. One thing I'll say is that as we talk about these treatments and energy work, Reiki, this type of work, we've talked a lot about the mind, the heart, and the spirit. The way that I would connect this back full circle to Center for Healing Neurology work is that that is our nervous system. That is the crux of our nervous system. Our nervous system is really our perception through the five doors of perception, as well as the extrasensory perception, the ways that we sense electromagnetic fields, the way we sense each other, the way we sense safety or danger. That is all we think of our perceptions as immutable or as we think of them as set Um, But what we see here and what we see with patients who often come, who have been sick, who have seen 20 to 40 doctors, the analogy that I typically give is that the patient is saying, there's a snake in the road. It's very, very bad. It's very wrong. And that what is actually in the road may be a stick, but that clinicians along the way have looked and seen no snake. And so they just say, there's no snake. You know, you're fine. Your health is fine. Your numbers are fine. Your numbers are good. You should seek mental health counseling. And that is a very typical story that we hear. And so what we do is span that bridge by noting that there may not be a a, a snake in the road, but there is something in the road. There is some sort of stick and that we have to figure out and help patients understand what is going on. And that these really are the mysteries that can be difficult to perceive. The labs that we do, the imaging, the testing, the procedures, the skin biopsy, the autonomic testing, all of this is really trying to, at some level, elucidate what may be invisible to the human scale and the naked eye. So these Ayurvedic treatments, as the Ayurvedic practitioner does the interview, assesses the patient, maybe feels the pulse, is getting more insight about the patient and then working with that insight and with that report and with the messages from the body that may be at some level still invisible to the eye. They may be visible, you know, like I'm holding my abdomen because I have abdominal pain. But when you look at an abdomen, you may not see pain unless you see those classic signs of inflammation, you know, redness, swelling, uh, heat, or pain still is how a person may be grimacing in their face, but you may not see any of those signs and a person may still have unrelenting abdominal pain or headaches. So part of it is looking at the patient and part of it is those things that may be invisible to the eye that we know are part of the neurological system. And that's why we have Ayurveda. That's why we have you, Jody, here at the Center for Healing Neurology is particularly to address these aspects of the nervous system. Thank you, Jillian. I I love what you just shared because ultimately, and you never really hear people speak of Ayurveda in this way, Ayurveda is an energy healing system ultimately because we use food, which is energy. That's one of the pillars of life in Ayurveda. The second pillar is right sleep, which just renews and restores our energy. And then the third pillar of life in Ayurveda is right use of energy. So Ayurveda says, you know, relatively speaking, you have these short, precious years on this earth, on this planet. How are you going to spend your time? And so Ayurveda says, you should spend your time in ways that are nourishing you, helping you to grow, helping you to evolve, inspiring. And just like you were saying, when, you know, testing and other results come back, quote unquote, good or fine, and people say, but still, I'm not fine. That's why Ayurveda can be such a profound approach because um, the approach is energetic or energy medicine. And we are energy. We know this. Mm -hmm. And our food is energy. Our sleep restores our energy. And how we use our energy in the world, all of this impacts us deeply. And Ayurveda looks at all of this. And usually what people find is it's so intuitive. Ayurveda makes so much sense to them. And they really understand it on a soul and heart level. And I think that with medicine like Ayurveda, which treats the whole being, that's where when the doctor or another practitioner only sees the stick and doesn't see the snake, that's where Ayurveda can see, for example, like you're saying, the snake. 
as you're talking about food being energy, I think people get confused because energy can feel so shifty or invisible or like new age in a way that is not of the earth, that is not in the dirt and in the grit of life. But one of the things we know from physics is that we actually, there's so much space between every molecule that we are actually more space than we are matter. We are actually more water than we are structure. So when we look at what physics tells us we are composed of, Ayurveda says we're spirits in the material world, that our physical body, um, which they call the Anamaya Kosha, I was just talking about this with a patient in clinic this week, our Anamaya Kosha are of our five sheaths, koshas of self, the Anamaya Kosha, Ana means food. So what we call the body that we, you know, squeeze into tight jeans and stick into high heel shoes. This is our food body. It is built of our food. And so it is absolutely energetically driven. And it's driven by the sun's energy that comes into plants that's captured in chloroplasts and made into plant material that is either consumed as plant material or that is consumed then by other animals and consumed as flesh. And then we, our metabolism, our energy transforms that transforms sun energy into our tissue and food in Ayurveda is supposed to transform from food, which is already photosynthesized energy into structure. And it's supposed to go from food into heat to tissue to immunity and to consciousness, right? So we should eat for the consciousness that we seek. But this is not a foofy in the clouds sort of energy life. This is means no. that you have to, at every moment, pay direct attention to the physical things that are in your environment and they're either support or their detriment to your health and your trajectory. So beautifully said. <laughs> it's so true. <laughs> And this lens, just what you described, literally, this lens can change a person's life, literally. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So I've had many patients over the years who have come back to me, and rarely do people say, it's that pill you gave me. What I hear most commonly mm -hmm. over the last 10 plus years that I've been in practice doing this, doing functional medicine and Ayurvedic and conventional care all integrated is people say, you taught me how to think about my life so that I could thread that needle so that I could skate along the sidewalk and make better choices about what to engage in and what, what uh, potholes to avoid. Mm -hmm. And that yes. is really the key of life. Yes. But in so many instances, we are not taught that, you know, we really live in a physical world and mm -hmm. what's emphasized so often is the mind and the intellect and Ayurveda speaks to both of those too, of course, but also the heart and the spirit. Mm -hmm. And that's why the treatments like you're just mentioning a minute ago, the treatments are nourishing on every level, of course, physically, of course, mentally too, but also emotionally, because that's one of the sheaths and consciousness, which you mentioned and spirit. And this is why people are so responsive to the treatments. They feel it working on all levels, not just on the physical level. This is why I, my primary recommendation for Ayurveda is not only anti-aging and rejuvenation, although that's a piece of it, and it's not only chronic pain, although that's a piece of it. A lot of it is actually um, autoimmune disease because autoimmune disease is a confusion of the immune system. The same way that we feel confused about you know, what is a healthy diet for those of us with poor acne or poor digestion, salad, raw foods, raw, unprocessed, uncut vegetables. So it's one thing to do juicing, you know, that makes nutrients more accessible, but a big giant raw kale salad can be very hard on digestion that is not primed up to the task. Yeah. And so what we think of as healthy may or may not be the things that are actually going to help move us forward. Sometimes what we need is just soup Yes, yes. I recommend a exactly. lot of soup. No, it's so true. But in our culture, in our society, especially today, what we're told is healthy are the raw vegetables and a lot of them. And it's, yes. it's not that, you know, we know vegetables are so healthy. They're just filled with prana. Our diet should consist mostly of vegetables, but you're right. They should be cooked and served warm. Yeah. Or they should be modulated for a person's digestive fire. So if you have a heavy coating mm -hmm. on your tongue and you get bloated and gassy every time you eat, you know, a big fat kale salad, then that may not be the right food for you at this time. It doesn't mean it'll always be the wrong food, but just yes. in the moment, 
And so that's how these Ayurvedic treatments are done. And that's why autoimmune disease is one of my primary prescriptions to have Ayurvedic body work done. And we've mm-hmm. talked a little bit about Reiki. Let's talk a little bit about Abhyanga. Abhyanga and Shiradhar. These are the two treatments that I typically recommend the most. What is Abhyanga? Yes. So Abhyanga is a full body warm oil massage. This is the traditional Ayurvedic treatment. And it's it's often the cornerstone treatment. It's sort of where we start. And then we might add other treatments to it. But like you said, Shiradhara and Abhyanga are the cornerstone treatments in Ayurveda. And Shiradhara can also be a standalone treatment. It's very profound on its own, but together there's such a nourishing combination. So with Abhyanga, we massage the entire body head to toe with warm medicinal oils. So they have certain herbs infused into them as well as essential oils. And we are oiliating the entire body with these very traditional strokes, moving sort of over the long bones in a certain way, over the joints in another way, over the abdomen in a special way. So we're really um, focusing on each area of the body in a really loving and very effective way just to help the oil that we're using deeply, deeply penetrate. And also we're working with the nervous system, soothing the nervous system, calming the mind. In each stroke, in each application of the warm oil, you just feel people relax even more. Relaxing is sort of a an infinite practice, we can always relax more. And you just sort of feel that in that unfolding in people during the treatment. So traditionally, Abhyanga is 60 minutes or sometimes 90 minutes, depending. And in using oil, I think it's important to note, and you know this too, Jillian, in Sanskrit, the word oil is used also, it's the same as the word love. So applying warm oil to the entire body is considered one of the greatest acts of self-care or self-love that we can do, anointing the body head to toe with oil. And with pairing it with Shiradhar, so we always start with Abhyanga and then Shiradhar would come second. We pour warm oil over the third eye, which is also known as the sixth chakra, Ajna chakra, this very profound energy center. It could also be called the mind center of the body, but it's the center for intuition, clear seeing, um, clear perceiving. And the oil starts there and it runs down the forehead over the crown of the head continuously. And depending on the person, we may pour the oil somewhere between 20 and 45 minutes. And this is so soothing for the nervous system, calming for the mind. And it generally transports people into a very deep space of relaxation. So it's recommended for people who are experiencing vata imbalances. So if there's anxiety, if there's immense stress, if there's restless sleep or insomnia, if you've just recently traveled and are experiencing jet lag, any type of high stress situation, Shiradhara is highly recommended. And if we're just doing Shiradhara as a standalone treatment, We always massage feet, hands, head, neck, shoulders. There's application of nausea oil, which I know we're going to talk more about in a moment. Application Mm -hmm. of warm steam towels. So we do all of this preparation to really help the person to relax. And then they're ready to receive. So being open and ready to receive is such an important part of our Ayurvedic treatments. And that's why we take such great care in helping people Mm -hmm. to relax so that they can receive the full benefit. And so does your hair get filled up with oil? Yes. So um, generally people's hair does get very oily. If you have longer hair, let's say shoulder length or longer, we do things to kind of separate the hair that we don't need to get oily. We kind of pull that area back, those hairs back. And then we're just focusing mostly on the, the crown of the head. And so after either Abhyanga or Shiradhara, the practitioners are really um, taking away as much oil as we can using warm steam towels and even dry towels in the hair. Mm-hmm. And then um, we share with people too how to lift the oil from their hair. And the best tip if you have oil in your hair is to apply shampoo to unwet hair, 
kind of lather up the shampoo as much as you can and then wet the hair. And generally that will lift the oil out on the first washing. But the oil, some people really, and I know you've experienced this too, where they say, I want to leave the oil in. It feels so good. Some people though want the oil out as soon as possible. And it just depends on their constitution and both are okay. So whatever the preference is, we sort of advise either way. And should a person bring a nice warm hat to the treatment that can get oily to go home with? Yes, that is such a good suggestion. Yeah. So after you received Shirodara and even after Abhyanga, because we do apply some warm oil to the crown of the head, even if we're only doing Abhyanga, is we don't want the head area region to get cold or for there to be wind or to be wet from rain. Mm-hmm. And so we recommend bring an old hat or bring an old hoodie, something to cover your head, an old scarf. And what happens if you don't like oil? What if oil creeps you out? Yes, right. Yeah, and so Ayurvedic treatments do include treatments where we don't use oil. We can do, for example, Garshana, where we use special gloves to sort of dry massage the skin. We can do Urdvartana, where we're using a combination of herb, herbal powders to sort of dry massage the skin. So these are also options. If someone knows for sure they don't like oil, of course, we honor and respect that. If someone's not sure, we would say, let's give it a try. You might, you might be surprised at how deeply beautiful having warm oil applied to your skin is. And what are the oils that are used? What are the oil yeah. options? And I'm asking partially knowing that folks who come to see us often have many multiple sensitivities. What are the yeah. oil options? Yes, that's such a good point. And we're really aware and we take time to ask people about their sensitivities. And also some people know their preferences for oil too, which is really helpful. But if somebody is a vata constitution, we tend towards sesame oil, avocado oil, almond oil. These oils would be infused with herbs like ashwagandha, bringaraj, bala, passion flower. Um, And they might have essential oils like bergamot, lavender, vanilla, lemongrass. Ling Ling, Sweet Orange. A person of Pitta constitution, we tend to use something like olive oil, sunflower, coconut, or ghee. And their oils might be infused with like herbs such as gaduchi, shatavari, licorice, coriander, lavender. And for a kapha constitution person, we tend toward canola oil, safflower, sometimes even mustard. Mm-hmm. And then the essential oils that we use um, rosemary, eucalyptus, calamus, tulsi, neem. Mm. So, and sometimes we don't use any infusion of the oil. Sometimes I know people are quite sensitive to scents and fragrance fragrances. So we can also use plain oils, just plain coconut, for example, or ghee Mm -hmm. or sesame. Yeah. And if people have an oil that they know that they love, can they bring it in for you to use? Yes, that sounds like always great. People do do that. It's wonderful. Okay. And then people who are in the habit of doing their own daily self-oil massage, they love so much when it can be applied by another person. And sometimes we do tandem abhyanga. There are two practitioners. We say four loving hands giving massage. That is such a special mm-hmm. uh, treatment. Mm-hmm. I know I can't wait till the pandemic is over and we can resume that. We have not been doing that here because of that, because of COVID-19. Yes. Um, but it's really good for the pit the mind because the pit the mind who always wants to criticize can really focus in on one person with two hands. But with two <laughs> people and four hands, the pit the mind gets a little scrambled and then is liberated, then can be released. <laughs> I love that. Yes. <laughs> Perfect for pit the for Perfect sure. for pit the yes. Mm-hmm. We've talked about Abhyanga and Shiradhara. So Shiradhara, that warm stream of oil on the forehead. Let's talk a little bit about Nasya. What's Nasya? What does Nasya mean? Yes. So Nasya is a medicated herbal oil. We generally apply three drops to each nostril when we're doing our traditional Abhyanga massage. But sometimes if people are suffering from some kind of sinus issue um, that's um, sort of chronic, we can do an entire treatment that's focused on like a nasal infusion treatment that would include also nausea. And so when we do a treatment that's entirely focused on sinuses or sinus infusion, 
we focus on steam, for example, mm -hmm. and also the inhalation of essential oils and other herbs. We do a lot of massage to help open up the area and just allow um, the channels to be open so energy can move and also matter can move. Mm -hmm. um, so my, um, in these treatments, definitely move a lot of mucus, a lot of congestion, not just from the nasal, but also from congestion in their head, even congestion in their lungs. And so we'll massage the chest and maybe the, the back, the upper back quite vigorously. We're applying steam towels and we're doing several rounds of this. A um, person may be facing up for a while while we're massaging and applying oils and applying steam towels. And then we turn them over where they can receive the steam infusion and the essential oils and other herbs um, and do inhalation for some time while we're massaging the back and even the head. And so we can, we, and we vary it. We tend to vary it where we do gentle massage and then we'll do something a little more vigorous to sort of loosen or break up any congestion that's there. And um, during, you know, throughout the sinus infusion treatment, people are encouraged if there's congestion, if there's mucus coming up, and then we're right there to support them. So there, they might be sitting or blowing. It can be, yes, such a profound treatment for people with chronic congestion or other sinus issues, even allergies, just to clear the channels. There's actually been some really interesting research around the nasal and sinus microbiome as well. So it's just across that thin cribriform plate to the brain. And so, and especially even with COVID-19, they talk about this virus may enter into, the reason it may be causing neurological symptoms is because it may be moving up that olfactory bulb into, across the blood-brain barrier and into the central nervous system. So by attending to the sinuses and attending to the nasal cavity and attending to the lungs, that whole respiratory track um, that starts, that's kind of focused in the middle of the head, the front and the middle of the head, there can be some great benefit and gain against neuroinflammation. So nausea is a treatment that I don't recommend infrequently. I would say is a treatment I recommend um, fairly frequently for folks. And the oil that we have here for treatments, nausea oil, includes eucalyptus and camphor and some other things. But sometimes I'll even just recommend coconut oil. People put coconut oil into their nose with their pinky fingers, mm -hmm. just doing a little mm -hmm. light massage with as far as it's comfortable to go, um, or especially brownie ghee. Yeah, beautiful. So, and chronic fatigue syndrome seems to have some potential also myalgic encephalomyelitis, MECFS, also seems to have some potential association with nasal and sinal uh, microbiome distortion. Yeah, and I love that you mentioned it can be a daily practice. Um, of course, we have the um, sort of longer treatment at mm -hmm. the Center for Healing Neurology, but as a daily practice, as you mentioned, just applying a few drops of nausea, uh, whether it's with a dropper or just your pinky finger, so helpful, even for the immune system. Mm -hmm. um, so everything you mentioned, and then it is a daily practice in Ayurveda. And I know mm -hmm. you carry it, the nausea oil there. Yep. So let's talk about oil in the ears. We just stick it everywhere, don't we? <laughs> yes, exactly. Yes. And this term oleation. So we're oileating the entire body. We're putting drops of oil in the nose, and then also we're bathing the ear canal with oil. And it's a beautiful practice called Karna Purana. And it really promotes optimal health, not just for the ears, but also the jaw. Mm -hmm. And it's actually an antidote to stress and anxiety, and it calms and soothes the nervous system. Mm -hmm. um, people will feel when we apply the warm oil, um, at first it might feel a similar sensation to as we feel when we go underwater. Mm -hmm. And so while the oil is bathing the ear canal, we're doing a lot of massage around the area in the neck, the face, the jaw. And so the oil is there for at least five minutes. And then we gently turn the person's head and that allows the oil to drain. And people's response to that drain of the oil, it's a profound release Mm -hmm. And that's why it can be so effective for anxiety and stress. People are shocked <laughs> at how profound yeah. it is. They think it's so basic. Oh, I put oil in the ear and then I drain it out. And it's so much more than that. 
And to have it done for you, um, coupled with all of the massage that we're doing in the area, can be an amazing release. And I've used this as a treatment for tinnitus. Yes. For patients who have struggled with tinnitus, it's not always effective. So this is not like a one and done, but especially for acute tinnitus, yes. um, it just started and people are being driven crazy. Um, yeah. Oil in the ears can be, I've had a few patients who have had full resolution. Yes. I think that's beautiful. And if someone were to come in and receive that um, at the Center for Healing Neurology, they experience it and then it can also be practiced maybe on their own at home with maybe with the help of a family member or it's actually possible to do it yourself which is some warm oil a dropper and just taking 10-15 minutes of your day to allow the oil to bathe and then not to drain give it time to drain and then do the other side yeah. we can become really proficient at actually applying it ourselves it's pretty awesome <laughs> Yes. So let's talk about, we have another whole class of treatments that we do here, which are the Basti treatments, Nitra Basti, yeah. Kathy Basti, um, Hrid Basti. What does, what does Basti mean? Because it also means something else that we don't do here. So. Right, right. Exactly. So there's internal Basti, which is similar to an enema, but in Ayurveda, enemas are very and nourishing for the colon and they are oil-based and herb-based. And then what we do at the Center for Healing Neurology is the external vasti. And as you mentioned, all of the names in Sanskrit, like netra is for the eyes and hrid is for the heart and kati is for the back, griva is for the neck and janu is for the knee. And so we place a warm portal of oil on a localized area of the body and it does work on physical pain, for example. However, it also works on an energetic level. And so these warm portals of oil, they're made from um, chickpea flour mm -hmm. as well as um, whole wheat flour, a combination of the two. And so we roll the dough the morning the patient is coming, prepared in advance. And then right after Abhyanga, for example, we would prepare that area of the body to receive the basti. And so we're placing this dough ring on the area of the body and then slowly, slowly applying the warm oil. And we might choose ghee. We might choose plain sesame. We might choose Mahanarayan oil. These are all traditionally used for the basti and the basti really acts like a portal. And if you think of a portal, like a threshold, it's where what is seen and what is unseen meet. So it's working on the physical level, what is seen, but also on the energetic level, it's a portal, it's an opening. And so, especially when we're applying, for example, the heart basti or the hrid basti, um, this is working on a physical level, of course, but also on an emotional level, an energetic level. So if there's deep grief or loss, sadness, Hridvasti would be recommended. Mm -hmm. And so generally we apply the oil and then we um, give a brief like, visualization, talk to the person, just kind of into receiving, you know, the oil, the basti, and then we just allow them to rest. And while they're resting, we're continually making sure the oil remains warm but we're also going to other areas of the body, like the feet or the head, depending, and doing energy work in between, just holding the feet, for example, holding the head. And then when it's time to replenish the basti with warm oil, we do that, and then we come back to the energy work. So it's also very nourishing. This is something that I have, that I have really loved really as loved targets as for target. specific issues over time. So for instance, when I've been doing a lot of computer work, then netrobasti, where you actually put yes. that dough ring over an eye, one eye at a time, or sometimes both eyes together, like dough goggles. Yeah. And you fill that you fill that ring with ghee or other oil. Um, typically a, I have done with ghee and then it's been done to me with ghee. And then I open my eye underneath the ghee. And what's amazing to me is that when you open your eye underneath, you know, it's not painful. It's not, it doesn't sting or anything and it just feels cloudy. But when you look down through the ghee to the, per the person's eye is clear, but up looking yeah. up through and it just forces a softening of the vision, which can be so relaxing for the mm -hmm. eyeballs, which are constantly active. If you've ever had an eye injury, you know, immobilizing an eye is one of the most impossible things to do. You can't, you can splint an arm, you, 
no matter how much you even keep an eye closed, it just doesn't, if the other eye is moving around, you, you can't immobilize an eye. And so it's, it's mm. very difficult to relax an eye. And our eyes work so hard, especially with all of our social media and our screens. Yes. You know, we're constantly looking at something that is typically close, typically bright, typically demanding, typically detailed, but in a weird way, static. So it's not like watching a birch tree in full bloom with all the leaves blow gently in the wind or blow in the wind, where there are so many things happening that the eye can really relax to take in the scene. Or when you look to the moon and you look, you know, you're looking all those thousands and thousands of miles away and your your eye can perceive and receive that light from all those miles away or looking across a valley. So there's many things that our eye are, has been set evolutionarily to do, but typically now we use it for one thing, which is to look at a screen of mm. various distance, whether it be a phone, a computer, a television, a movie screen. Um, and especially in this time of the pandemic with most of us staying at home, we're not necessarily looking long, long distances. And so Netrobasti can be a treatment that really rejuvenates and restores the eyes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. It's so healing. And especially like you were just describing now where it seems that everything we're doing because of the pandemic is online. We're already looking at screens too much and now yeah. even more so. <laughs> it's so needed. Yes. So those are our Basti treatments. We do not do um, any type of enema here in our clinic, although it can be recommended as part of a larger program. So let's talk a little bit about that program. What is yes. Panchakarma? Yes, yeah, so Panchakarma is Ayurveda's traditional detoxification system. It's gentle in some ways and deeply profound, deeply detoxifying. And the reason that I, I say that it's, it's gentle is because it works in three phases. The first phase is the Purvakarma, where you're eating a certain diet, taking certain herbs, and also taking ghee for internal oilation. And the food is nourishing. It's delicious. Some people find the ghee taking easy. Some people find it more difficult. And we have a lot of tips and tricks to help people take the ghee. But we take the ghee because it um, helps to remove toxins from our bodies. And then the second stage is actually panchakarma, where you're coming into the Center for Healing Neurology receiving five days of consecutive nourishing treatments. Many of the treatments we've just described, like Abhyanga, Shirodhara, Nastya, as well as Basti, are included in a Panchakarma treatment in a single day. We're doing all of these. How long does treatments. it take each day? It takes around three hours, mm -hmm. around three hours. It could be a tiny bit less, could be a little bit more. It totally depends on the person. Mm -hmm. And... During this time, people will come in, and you and I were talking about this too, Jillian, how people will often say they've never felt so cared for in their lives. They've never felt so nourished in their lives. And your body is doing very hard work in detoxifying. Mm -hmm. And all of these treatments help the body's process in eliminating toxins and releasing the toxins. And so we, that's why we do it for five consecutive days. Mm -hmm. And then the third phase is Rasayana or the period of rejuvenation. And that's also guided with practices of, you know, self-care and there's um, an herbal protocol. And Panchakarma is often described in like traditional texts as a rebirth. It's really like making oneself new. So as you know, we move through life, we accumulate so many toxins, not just from our environment, but also from our foods, from our stressors. And this is a beautiful way to help release them. So people who have been dealing with um, maybe a chronic illness, they've been working toward healing in different ways, supportive ways. And often panchakarma can be the deep cleanse that's needed to sort of bring about full healing or full balance. Mm -hmm. Also, people will do it. Um, it's recommended we do it every fall and also every spring, just these two times of year where we're very supported by the rhythms of nature to cleanse and our body just naturally wants to cleanse. Mm -hmm. And it can also be done at any time a person feels they need to detoxify. And sometimes people even do it for sort of milestone birthdays or 
they feel like they've put their self-care on the back burner and they, they want to do something really special for themselves. And so they'll give themselves the gift of panchakarma. So you don't have to have anything necessarily medically wrong, but it just feels like the right time to do a deeper cleanse. The way that I think about PK is that we are, our bodies are kind of like a jet engine in flight and you can't, unlike a jet engine, you can't land it, take parts off, put parts back on and then have it take off again. And so Panchakarma hits the reset button while the jet engine continues to fly. Mm, nice. So while Love we that. continue to function, because we need to continue eating yeah. and metabolizing and heating our tissues and thinking and moving our busy eyeballs around and attending to our lives. So breathing, we can't necessarily go in like mechanics and take things off and put things back on. And any kind of deep change puts the body a little bit into panic, right? That's why we all get constipated when we fly because Mm -hmm. flying in a metal tube at 300 miles an hour is uh, what is not, we do not evolutionary adapt to the head. Yeah. Yeah. Right. (laughs) If that ever happened in nature, something was very, very Mm -hmm. wrong. And so If we're going to do, if we're going to ask the body to do deep change, then we have to essentially cocoon it in a protective womb, essentially of oil and warmth and relaxation so that the body can feel safe enough to detox. And I think that is one of the major contributions of Ayurveda to the detoxification world, right? So we all know, even though detox in air quotes I'm making has become such a hit word that if you detox, you'll be okay. The problem is, is that if you detox without support, without supporting your whole system, then your system gets thrown into kind of a panic. And then it doesn't actually detox because if the hurricane is coming, it's not the time to vacuum or clean the baseboards. It's the time to batten down the hatches. And so you don't pay attention to repair and maintenance and restoration. You don't do restorative work when the hurricane is coming. And so if we're going to ask so much of the body, then we have to give it deep support mm-hmm. to do this. We all well know that the environmental burden, our, our toxic burden on our bodies is fairly immense and it's only growing in, in our environment. We have 90,000 chemicals that have been put into the environment since World War II. Um, most of them have not been vetted by the FDA Many of them are known carcinogens and we continue to use them, even flame retardants in children's clothing. Mm -hmm. Even, you know, I was just talking about this yesterday about the excipients in medications and pharmaceuticals. We're doing a webinar February 4th. So many of you may be listening to this after that, but it'll still be available. But there's things like shellac and talc and other things that are not necessarily food items that help stabilize or give a shelf life to products. So when we talk about pulling out preservatives from our food, um, from our personal care products, from our detergents and our soaps, from our uh, cleansers in our house, all of those things that we have used up to this point often stay in our system. They may or may not be processed through. And so having an ongoing system, an ongoing plan for seasonal detoxification, for hitting that deep reset button. At le- I do punch yeah. karma at least once a year mm-hmm. um, because I feel like it corrects my cravings and then I can make better decisions. It mm. clears my mind, it clears my system. Yeah. Um, and that's what I want to be doing when I'm 95 years old is making good decisions. <laughs> yes. So Panchakarma, this deep process, three phases. Um, so support with a consultation before and a post consultation, and then five days of three hours of treatment, which will be customized for your intention and for your constitution and for where your constitution currently stands um, and may include Abhyanga, Shiradhara, various Basti treatments, ear oil, Nasya oil, um, and then there's one we haven't discussed actually is steam. So we have a mm-hmm. little steam box here in the clinic, a pop-up steam tent. <laughs> what does steam do? Yeah, really ultimately steam helps to remove waste from, from the body. And it, it's actually pacifying for all three doshas. It just depends on the, the time for each constitution. Um, that will indicate how long a person would steam. Mm-hmm. And in addition to the steam, we're also using essential oils. So during the time the person is steaming, we're also supporting them just by placing a cool cloth that's been infused with some spearmint oil or peppermint oil. And that is 
goes over the head just to sort of keep the person cool while they're in the steam. Yes, and so we're just sort of watching for some signs. We never want anybody to oversteam because that mm -hmm. can be depleting. So we're just with the person while they're steaming, watching for the signs, and then we know when the body says it's enough, and then we kind of turn off the steam and allow the person just to rest. Um, yeah, and that's just just also deeply toxifying. It's one more way to help remove the toxins from the system. Jody, we have covered a huge swath of territory in talking about the nature of Ayurveda, the nature of us as, as people, as animals on the planet, mm. and then some of the treatments um, that can be done here at Center for Healing Neurology within the Ayurvedic framework. I want to mention one last thing, which is one of the ways that I think about Ayurvedic, these Ayurvedic treatments is that they help resolve the cell danger response. And the cell danger response we talk about in um, podcast for healing neurology number six, which was a class we did. The sound is not great. I apologize for that. But um, the cell danger response, the concept of that was really put forward by Dr. Robert Navio at uh, University of California in San Diego and a number of his team's papers about how the mitochondria are energy producers, the energy producing organelles in all of our cells respond to threat. And they often transition from being power stations and making our ATP, making our energy into battle stations. And they divert their purinergic signaling instead of towards making energy through the electron transport chain into announcing threat. And what happens when threat is announced, the first thing is that communication lines are cut off because you don't a, a cell in the shoulder doesn't need to tell what's going on to a cell in the toe if the shoulder cell needs to focus on an acute issue that's right there in front of them. So they don't waste their time and they often cut ties because knowing that those cells may be gone, may be changing. And so there are ways that the body becomes fragmented and that that impacts the immune system. And what is supposed to happen is that the cell danger response walks through its full clockwork cycle and then resolves. And in our, what Dr. Navio says is that thus far in our medical vernacular, we've learned how to save people and we've learned how to help people with some deep disease like cancer. But what we have not yet learned how to do is restore and rejuvenate people to their new, stable, normal cell danger response resolved baseline. And that is what these treatments are here to do. They reconnect that shoulder with that toe cell. They reconnect all across the lines of the body so that the body once again can listen to itself, can hear all the cellular signaling that happens billions and billions and billions of times every second throughout the body. And so really restoring the communication, that cellular communication is what can re- store the intelligence of our immune system. So I didn't want to end this podcast without talking about that because I think that there, as we get further on in the next five to 10 years, my prediction is that we will find the molecular basis for the benefit of these Ayurvedic treatments. But even without knowing that, we can see their effectiveness. Mm -hmm. So I just wanted to yeah. put that in there. And I want to say, Jillian, I absolutely love how you can describe, it's such a great gift, these very complex oh, medical you. issues and just in really layman's terms. So thank you so much for that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I don't, you know, it's not, huh, it's not rocket science, <laughs> <laughs> which I definitely don't understand. It's just <laughs> Ayurveda and medicine. We live in these bodies. So it is um, to our greatest advantage to be able to listen into what our bodies are telling us they need, to be able to assess whether that's an accurate or an inaccurate message, and then be able to backstep our way to restoration so that the signals that we get from our body are the ones that we should follow. And Ayurvedic treatments absolutely can be instrumental, have been instrumental in my practice working with patients as well as personally the last 20 some years that I've been studying and learning Ayurveda and practicing Ayurveda. So any last thoughts, Jody, before we close about Ayurveda, about I treatments? You clearly love doing them. You're such a gift to patients. Oh, thank you for saying that. It's true. I like you, I have a deep passion for Ayurveda and I believe in it so much. And I've seen how it's healed my body, my mind, my spirit. And also 
over all of these years, seeing how it helps others to heal. And in some cases, for some people, it's uh, radically life-changing, actually. It just gives yeah. them new perspective, new lens. Yeah. And I just want to come back to Ayurveda's three pillars of life, right? Mm-hmm. Food, right sleep, and right use of energy. Like you, you were saying, it's so simple. Mm-hmm. And I love how intuitive it is and how people, when they hear the philosophy of Ayurveda, when they hear the teachings, they resonate. It really speaks to them because it just makes so much sense on a deep intuitive level. It's something they actually already know. And you and I both know this. Ayurveda is considered a self-healing science. Mm -hmm. It's practical. We use it every single day. Mm -hmm. And um, there's nothing that's uh, mysterious about it. It's for everyone. Yes. Every person. Yeah. So teenage boys, football dudes. (laughs) Yeah. Yoga ladies, <laughs> children, <Exactly>. totally. <laughs> engineers, yeah. surgeons, mm-hmm. heroin addicts. I mean, all of us, alcoholics, Perfect. all of us, all the all people. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. And it's, um, yeah, it's such a gift really to humanity. And that was the intention from its in- yeah. to humanity. And we're so, so fortunate to know it, that it still exists today for us to know. And I think it's going to be really helpful for long haul COVID. Mm -hmm. Um, So I'm already using it with COVID long haulers and finding benefit in conjunction Mm -hmm. with other treatments that we have here. But it is a huge piece of the puzzle because it, again, it resolves that cell danger response. It it restores that long distance cellular communication in the system. Mm -hmm. Um, And in addition to that, if you think about how depleting life can be, just our pace of modern life. Yeah. Ayurveda truly is the antidote to that. It teaches yeah. us how to care for ourselves, how to move at a slightly slower pace, yeah. how to nourish ourselves on a deep, deep level. And it's all so simple. Well, thank you so much for joining us, Jody. It's always a pleasure. Thank and thank you, you so too, much. Jillian. Your passion, enthusiasm for Ayurveda is absolutely infectious. And it's really an honor to work with you at the Center for Healing Neurology. I love being here. Oh, I love working with you too. I, and I love you've joined us. I love that you're here. I love that you're available for our patients who need you so desperately, um, as do I. Um, thank you, so Jillian. I'm really grateful. Thanks for all you do. Thank you. And thank you, listeners for listening today with Jody Boone, one of our fantastic Ayurvedic practitioners. We've got lots of ways to continue this conversation through Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. And you can get more information from and about us, including Jody and the Ayurvedic treatments at centerforhealingneurology.com. Even better, come see us and experience Jody's magic in the clinic room. Be sure to share this show with your friends and we welcome your rating and review wherever you get your podcasts and feel free to send topic requests to podcast at centerforhealingneurology.com. We love that you've joined us today to discuss how to make our whole world medicine. We rise or fall together and we're committed to doing what we can to make as many of us as healthy as possible. And this takes all of us, including you. So thank you for listening and we'll see you next time. Media. Party Fish Media acknowledges that it operates and records on indigenous Duwamish and Puget Sound Coast Salish land that is still home to the Duwamish tribe. This land is stolen in violation of the Point Elliot Treaty of 1855. We are committed to uplifting the name of these lands and community members from these nations who reside alongside us. For more information on this land, its people, or ways you can help, visit duwamishtribe.org or realrentduwamish.org.